All right, so in the last chapter, um, Samuel came up on the other settlement that was near his home, and he um, noticed that they um, had been through the same thing that his family had been through, except that there was an older man still there. His name was Old Bobby, and Old Bobby um, was a little different. He was singing. He wouldn't really talk to Samuel, and one thing was interesting to me and I didn't want to point this out until you responded um, but why do you think that old Bobby was spared why do you think the Indians didn't take him or hurt him um, and that was kind of answered in the chapter when he said that he remembered something about Indians that um, they thought that people that were crazy so to speak crazy or weren't in their right mind um, had like a connection with a higher power like God or, or spirits um, and so that they felt like that they should be protected so um, in Samuel's mind he's thinking that that is why um, the Indians or now we think we know that he thinks Indians um, were the ones that captured um, his family I was um, we we think that's why they didn't take Bobby because um, Bobby seems to be maybe not quite right um, in the way he thinks about things um, maybe he's challenged in some way okay so I'm gonna read chapter 7 but I'm gonna read the blurb first the world the war for independence very rapidly turned into something like a world war Native Americans fought on both sides and Spain got involved on the American side or at least its Navy did Germany sent the mercenaries known as Hessians. The French were a staunch ally of the United States, with their navy keeping England from resupplying her troops and distracting it from the American navy. The English navy, in fact, was so preoccupied with the French that it could not focus on the American problem. Chapter 7 He had been running for 40 hours now. All right, 40 hours. 24 hours in a day, 40 hours, so almost two days, he's been running through the woods um, trying to chase down these tracks. Just as he left Draper's Crossing, he passed a cornfield that the attackers had tried to burn. Some ears of corn had been roasted. Hunger took him like a wolf, and he grabbed a half dozen ears, jamming them in his clothing. He ate as he walked letting the sweet corn juice slide down his throat and into his stomach. The hunger was so intense that eating the corn made his jaws ache. The food made his body demand water. He hadn't taken time to find a well or where one was. When he came to a small creek, he stopped to drink. The water was muddy where the creek crossed the trail, so he moved off into the thick underbrush 20 yards upstream to where the creek ran clear. He knelt to put his mouth to the water, and this act saved his life. Hmm. His lips had no sooner touched the water than he heard men's voices. So he leaned down and put his lips towards the water to drink, and he said that saved his life. He heard voices. So when he leaned down to get the water, he was out of their sight. It was a native tongue, and they were loud and laughing. There were two of them. Had they come upon Samuel, they surely would have taken or killed him. Samuel kept his head near the ground. Through small holes in the brush, he could see them from the waist down. They wore leather leggings and high moccasins and each carried a musket in one hand. He could see the butts hanging down at their sides and either a coop stick or a killing lance in the other. Both of the men had fresh scalps hanging on the shafts they carried. Scalps like the top part of your head. So um, it said that they scalped some of the people. Um, gosh, that's terrible. But they would scalp people and then take the skin that they cut off and they would hang it kind of like a, um, I don't know, like an offering or like a medal almost for a victory, a piece of victory. For the first time in his life, Samuel wanted to kill a man. The overwhelming rage that he had begun to feel while following his mother's small footprints as she'd been savagely jerked along a trail was like a hot knife in his brain. If there had only been one, he would have done it. 
but he carried no tomahawk. All he had was a skinning knife, and his rifle fired only one shot. After that, the one he didn't shoot would turn on him before he could reload. With only a knife to defend himself, he'd have almost no chance. So he waited until they were out of sight. Then, staying low and moving slowly, he went back to the trail. Why had the men come back? Whatever the reason, two men alone would not backtrack too far into potentially hostile country. If there were any kind of force after them, they would want to keep moving. So Samuel thought, maybe I'm getting close. He picked up the pace to a jog, but stayed well to the side of the trail on the edge of the thicker undergrowth in case he ran into any others. And again, this move saved his life. Clearings left by old beaver ponds were scattered through the forest. Some were small, an acre or two. Others were 30 or 40 acres. A large clearing popped up in front of Samuel now. It was late afternoon, almost evening, and the sun slanted from the west behind him into the clearing. It was another stroke of luck. The clearing had been turned into a large encampment filled with Indians. Some British soldiers in red uniforms, and nearly a quarter of a mile away, freight wagons hooked up to the horses. Samuel slid into the underbrush. He crawled farther back where he couldn't be seen. Unfortunately, he couldn't see either, and he squatted in the thick foliage and tried to remember what he'd seen. Three wagons ready to go out. Ten or fifteen soldiers, including three officers on horses and ten or fifteen Indians. He shook his head. No, not so many soldiers. Seven or eight and fewer Indians. Eight or nine. One large fire in the center of the clearing. One smaller one close to the wagons. A group of people hovered there. The captives. There hadn't been time to see them clearly, and they were too far away from him to see if it was his mother and father in the group. In a rope pen near the wagons were one or two horses, three or four oxen, maybe a milk cow. There was also a spit set up over the larger fire with some kind of big animal cooking, which meant they weren't going to be here for some time, perhaps the night. I'm sorry, they which meant they were going to be here for some time, perhaps the night. So this huge animal is cooking, so it lets them know, well, they're going to be here for a while because they've got to wait for it to stop cooking and eat. He settled slowly back on his haunches, careful not to move the brush around him. He had caught up to them. There was a chance his mother and father were with that group of captives. He still had no plan to rescue them. Everything he'd done was just to catch up, see if they were still alive. Could they be here? He hadn't come across their bodies on the trail, and there were captives by the fire. For that, for the moment, that was enough. The plan would come later. It would be dark soon. There was still no moon. Now he was astonished that it had only been forty or so hours since he returned from the hunt. His whole life, everything in it and, and around it, was different now. Torn and gutted and forever changed from all that it had been, it would never be the same. And in the dark, he thought, with no moon, in the near pitch dark of starlight, there might be possibilities. He had no plan, but it would be dark soon, and just then, as he settled back to wait and think on some way to get to the captives without being discovered, the whole world blew up. What do you think that means, the whole world blew up? What do you think just happened? I want you to write for your response. I want you to describe what you see in your head as I read the last part of this chapter. So he's in bushes and he's far back under them. And when he looks out, I want you to give me a description of some of the things he sees. He sees Indians, he sees British soldiers. Tell me some of the other things that he saw.